This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Chapter 3 is relatively short and deals with boundaries and systems, and again, some ways of organising a business. It begins with a definition of a system, a set of things working together as parts of a mechanism or an interconnecting network, a complex whole. So, for example, you would have probably heard the phrase an IT system or a computer system. And in a computer system, you do have a number of items working together. You've got the, the hard disk drive, you've got the, uh, the video monitor, you've got the keyboard, uh, you've got the, uh, the microprocessing, you've got the, uh, the software indeed working uh, with the hardware. And they have to kind of integrate and work uh, in, in, in an organized way. Or we talk about the accounting system. In the accounting system, you would have the uh, payables, where you pay your suppliers, receivables, where you receive money from your customers. Uh, you have got uh, the wages and salaries, you have budgeting and so on. And these are all elements of the uh, system which work together. Indeed, a whole business is a system. Uh, we saw under the functional uh, uh, structure, uh, typically, we had accounting, we had sales, we had purchasing, we had manufacturing, perhaps we had research and development, perhaps we had human resources uh, management, uh, and all of these form this complex whole, which is the organization. Well, so what? Uh, well, uh, uh, so what to some extent is uh, because you need to know some of the terminology uh, that's uh, within it, uh, but it can actually be of, of, of some use. Uh, uh, to us, this idea of uh, systems theory. So first of all, uh, a little bit of the uh, terminology. You have uh, the system itself, for example, the, the organization, and then you have its environment. So the environment of a, of a business is the national environment, the international environment, uh, the competition, the legislation uh, in, in which the business actually operates and sits. Uh, in the environment, there are your customers, uh, there may be the shareholders, the government, many of the stakeholders, in a way the external stakeholders, are forming part of the environment. And most systems interact uh, with their environment. First of all, you have to know where the system boundary is, what is part of us and what is not part of us. So uh, if, for example, you sell uh, an item, and after a few months the item breaks down, in a way you have to know whether that is to do with us, the system, or whether that event is purely to do with the environment, uh, because depending which one it is, uh, maybe uh, we'll determine who has to pay to put the item right. We'll come back to, to this uh, cut-off, if you like, what's us, the system, what's outside the environment. And most systems interact with the environment, they have inputs coming in, and the outputs going out. So a typical manufacturing system will have raw materials coming in and finished products uh, going out. Uh, a school has uh, uneducated children coming in and hopefully uh, educated somewhat older children coming out and, uh, and, and so on. And what happens in the system is some sort of processing, some sort of uh, transformation takes place, uh, whether it is production or whether it is, is, is providing some sort of services. The system's uh, boundary uh, there, uh, we can also then begin to look a little bit more in terms of subsystems. Because most systems can be broken down into a subsystem, and indeed those subsystems can be further broken down into smaller systems. So if you take the whole organization, one of its subsystems is the accounting department. But a subsystem within the subsystem of the accounting department could be the receivables. Uh, and even within receivables, you might be able to break that down a little bit. Uh, there might be a part of that system, another subsystem, uh, which looks after uh, accepting new customers, getting credit references and so on. Uh, another part of the system could be voices. Another system, uh, subsystem could be chasing up payments, which are very slow. So if the organization, the accounting department, uh, we have the receivables department, it is then breaking down maybe into three or more subsystems. 
Each of these subsystems has got input and output. Uh, and what's important, again, getting back to systems boundary, is where the input and the output, where the, where the dividing line is, uh, where the system boundary is. Because that, in a way, determines where the responsibility is. So, uh, if we're looking at, say, inventory, and we need to, well, somebody needs to order new goods, new, new raw materials. Uh, but who should be ordering new raw materials? Should it be the purchasing department, or should it be somebody from inventory uh, in the warehouse, or should it indeed be people in the manufacturing department? Uh, to some extent, it doesn't much matter. Uh, but we must know whose responsibility that is, whose subsystem that process is actually part of, because you don't want duplication and you don't want gaps. So, so applying this kind of system as methodology uh, can make people think about where almost the handover of responsibility is uh, as products or services are provided. The second thing to note about uh, systems is this business of open and closed systems. Uh, most systems are open and this means that they have some sort of communication or some sort of input-output with the environment and nearly all systems have that. In theory you can have a completely isolated and closed off system which has got no interaction with its environment whatsoever. It's very difficult to think of a commercial example of this. It is more a, almost a scientific example. Well, for some scientific experiments, what you want to do is to isolate the system. You don't let heat come in or out of the system, uh, uh, but therefore you can, you can measure certain characteristics, uh, maybe to do with the thermodynamics, which is occurring within the system. But it's not really going to work in the real world, if you like, or certainly not in business, because most businesses require constant raw materials coming in and they require people to buy those so it has to go out there. Uh, it actually requires more than that. It actually requires input in terms of knowledge, for example, about uh, what your competitors are doing. When you're selling items, you have to take into the system some knowledge of what your competitors are charging and, and what their products are like and whether yours are actually competitive. Really, if you have a closed system which pays no regard whatsoever to what's happening in the environment, its life is going to be very short. What it's doing will become, even if it had the energy to do it, but what it's doing will become increasingly irrelevant. It's rather like a closed manufacturer who takes no notice whatsoever of what current fashions are. They continue making the same shirts, for example, uh, and these become, in a way, wildly out of fashion because they haven't taken in the input of what people want to buy. Outsourcing. Outsourcing is where you decide not to do something yourself, uh, but to give the work to outside suppliers. And it has become very, very common. Uh, and it seems to end the way many businesses are going. Uh, Forty years ago, many businesses would try to uh, completely, what was, what was called vertically integrate. I remember one of the first audit clients I ever worked on uh, made shirts. At least that's what we saw as a public. But in fact, the client owned cotton plantations uh, it turned the cotton into a yarn, it uh, wove the cloth, it made the shirts, and it had its own chain of retail shops. It was completely vertically integrated throughout. Most businesses don't do that anymore, and we'll, we'll, we'll see why in a moment. But here we have some examples of what can be outsourced, what is commonly outsourced, uh, manufacturing. For example, Apple, fantastically uh, successful company, but it doesn't actually manufacture, for example, its iPhones. What Apple does uh, is to design the hardware, design the software, design the interface, look after a lot of the marketing, uh, and it outsources the manufacturing of its iPhones uh, to companies largely in China, companies like Foxconn, 
who've got massive manufacturing plants uh, and where the labour costs are somewhat lower than, for example, in America. IT is often outsourced. Uh, IT is a bit specialist. IT for many businesses is not how they make their money. It's a kind of necessary evil. Uh, you have to have uh, record keeping and, uh, and, and, and so on. You have to run your, your, your website and so on. Uh, but if we're going to do it internally, it means recruiting a whole lot of experts. It means worrying about something else. Maybe better to offload that outside to the people who are experts in uh, website design and running websites and so on. And we can concentrate on what we're really good at, what, what, and ideally what we are uniquely good at. Very quickly, the other ones, human resources, functions. Uh, some uh, companies uh, get human resources, consultants to do recruitment, uh, training, promotion. They even take part sometimes in grievance and disciplinary procedures. Design, uh, manufacturing companies. They might be very good at manufacturing, but they might be a bit weak in design. Uh, and sometimes to, uh, to design almost a, a blockbuster product, uh, they will get experts in to, to do that. And the final example we have here is distribution. You would have seen that this is very common. You've got companies like uh, DHL, UPS, TNT, uh, these so-called so logistics companies uh, who do a, a tremendous amount of the uh, supply of raw materials and then taking those finished goods out again to customers. And uh, there are great advantages in doing that these these people have got vans and lorries all over the country whereas if you were doing it yourself uh, then it could be very expensive and very inefficient to run your own distribution system so what are the uh, claimed advantages and disadvantages of outsourcing and here are the claimed advantages first of all it might save costs uh, there's a thought that almost that if you wanted something done cheaply, you do it yourself. Uh, whereas if you outsource it, you have to pay for that other person's profit. Uh, in fact, the other person might be so efficient at doing what you're outsourcing is that they can make a profit and actually be cheaper uh, than it would be for you to do it yourself. Uh, a lot of outsourcing uh, goes to offshoring. Uh, in other words, you outsource to someone abroad and this can make use of cheap labour costs, uh, but also if your market is abroad, it might be actually cheaper to make the product in the country where the product is going to be sold. Uh, that might cut down on distribution costs and damage as, as goods are uh, transferred for long distances. Outsourcing turns fixed costs into variable costs. If I have my own factory, even if the factory is idle, I'm still having to pay for the rent and some residual heating and, and, and so on. If instead of my own factory, I subcontract or outsource all of the production to somebody else, uh, if I don't need products, then I just don't order them. Uh, and all of my kind of product cost just disappears. So if you're in a very kind of volatile market, you might find it better to outsource and you can just cut off many of these costs if your market shrinks. It transfers risk. Uh, some undertakings have a lot of risk associated with them. Even the designing of a, a fancy website might go wrong. Uh, you're, you're trying to do it yourself. You spend uh, thousands and thousands of dollars developing this website uh, and it doesn't work very well at the end of the day. Then, then you've got no fallback really if you give that work to an outsourced company to do the design and maybe the running of the website, if it doesn't work, if anything goes wrong with it, it's their call, it's their problem, uh, and they have to spend money to, to get it right. There's some physically risky activities. Uh, in many, many uh, buildings in the UK, older buildings, uh, a product called asbestos has been uh, discovered. It was put in as a uh, fire resistant uh, kind of a product but it's been discovered to be very dangerous and if it is discovered it really has to be removed from from buildings uh, and removing it is is immensely risky you have to be very careful that none of the uh, product escapes into the environment and harms other people and specialist asbestos removal firms are the people who take all of that risk away from you and then there is access to technical expertise 
it can be very difficult to maintain fantastic experts full-time in your business, apart from the expense they might get bored. And it might be better just to dip into expertise by uh, appointing outsourcers as you need them. However, there are certain potential disadvantages. Uh, first, uh, there can be a problem with the quality and the level of service. So if you are using a logistics company to deliver uh, products to your customers, and that logistics company is late by a couple of days, then your customer is going to come to you. There's, there's no point in you saying, oh, it was DHL's fault because they were late or they got lost or the sat-nav didn't work or something. Uh, you have to make sure that uh, who, to, to whomever you outsource to uh, will be able to deliver a proper service, a good quality, because if they don't, then it is you who are hurt. It can escape, let confidential data out into the wild to escape. So if you are producing a, a very clever iPhone with very uh, clever and uh, somewhat secret uh, components or methods of working, uh, then of course you really have to tell your outsource manufacturer uh, how to make it. Uh, or perhaps if you're outsourcing the maintenance of your sales ledger, that's often done, your receivables ledger is outsourced to people called factors, and of course they have a complete list of all your customers and could see who the big customers are and what they uh, buy and so on. That data could be uh, potentially very valuable to a rival. Outsourcing can, of course, be more expensive. Uh, the people to whom you outsource it may, may, you know, may make a decent margin and actually turn out to be much more expensive than doing it yourself. The next two I'll take uh, together uh, a kind of lack of responsiveness and different objectives. Really, the outsourcer would like to just keep repeating. Uh, if they repeat things, then, of course, they, uh, they get very efficient at it and uh, the, the like, uh, uh, whereas you would like them to keep improving, to keep innovating. Uh, and so there can be a bit of a, a little bit of a standoff there. You want them to change and improve what they're doing on your behalf. They will actually make more money in many ways by just repeating what they've always done and not need new machinery and new people and new training. Uh, and we would have to make sure that in any outsourced contract, there was, there was some way in which you can encourage or indeed demand innovation. And then transport time and costs. Uh, if you make goods abroad and for sale in this country, they have to be transported to this country. Uh, there's a delay, there's a cost in there, there is obviously the, the chance of damage uh, to the goods in transit. But as I say, a tremendous number of businesses uh, find that the, uh, it is better now to outsource to really good specialists who are really good and efficient and reliable at what they do. And your business kind of shrinks down so that what you do is you concentrate on where you are particularly good and where you really make your profits. Alliances. Uh, alliances, uh, easy alliances, just agreements between two or more organizations to cooperate. Uh, a good example of an alliance is what you find in airlines. You have indeed got uh, 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 these airlines uh, competing. Uh, so you have maybe got uh, American Airlines, British Airways, another one. Uh, and what they do is they can, in a way, piece together a route for you. So you might start off on British Airways and then you change to American Airlines and so on. But essentially it's all on one, one ticket. And if you earn uh, miles on British Airways, you can also spend those in American Airlines flights and, and so on. What it does is to allow these suppliers uh, in a way to appear bigger than perhaps they are and to also get certain economies of scale in these uh, uh, corporations where, where you might actually expect them to be rivals. Uh, they might actually get something useful from being cooperative. Another example of alliances uh, would be a joint venture uh, where uh, when maybe 30 years ago uh, in Europe they began to develop the Airbus as a rival to Boeing planes. That was a joint venture between four European aerospace companies. <clears throat> no one company on its own uh, would maybe could, could have afforded to develop a new civil airliner, 
but there's certainly a lot of risk involved in doing that, certainly a lot of the expertise involved. And they found it better to cooperate by forming a joint venture. You spread the finance, you spread the risk, and you pool the expertise in the joint venture, which in fact was very successful for them. Some modern types of organization, or almost this organization, I suppose, uh, here, relatively new, uh, unconventional, flexible structures uh, that often dispense with the normal kind of functional structure and the scalar chain that you would find in conventional businesses. And there are three types, the hollow organization, the virtual or network organization, and the modular organization. So first of all, the hollow organization. I think you could probably say that Apple was a bit like this. It retains its core competences, which is basically design, uh, and key personnel do that and develop some of the, uh, the software in particular. Uh, but a lot of the other stuff has been outsourced. Uh, all the manufacturing is essentially outsourced. Of course, they've reversed a little bit of this. Uh, they used to uh, not have their own shops, but now, of course, they've decided that it's worthwhile not outsourcing all the retail, but to have a lot of that in-house because the, the, the Apple stores, which they have, of course, are, are a unique sort of a, a, a style that's with them that they say uh, promotes the brand very well. A modular organization uh, extends the uh, hollow concept really by breaking down a production or the provision of services into different modules and giving each one of these tasks to, to different companies so that you kind of build up, uh, instead of putting all your manufacturing to one outsource company, you divide your manufacturing into three different processes or maybe different components and you outsource kind of multiply and maybe there's then a fourth outsourcer who will bring these three components together and assemble them into your finished product. And then, uh, I suppose, in, as an extreme example of hollow, that the organization barely exists uh, at all. Uh, there is almost no office. Uh, you communicate electronically. You organize sales through some people, organize purchases through another, uh, organize the manufacturing somewhere else, organize the logistics in a different sort of a way. Uh, and really, you're at the center of a, a spider's web, almost, uh, making all of these other companies uh, uh, do what you want, kind of coordinating them uh, to produce the product or to deliver the service. And finally, shared service centers. Uh, shared service centers uh, is uh, bringing a kind of specialization uh, and centralization to certain services. So, for example, take a nationwide firm of accountants. So they have offices in London, Reading, Southampton, Bristol, Plymouth, Cardiff, all the way up through uh, the UK. Now, how should they organize, uh, for example, their accounting, their own, own internal accounting? How should they organize the computing systems which take care of all the, the billing and tracking of people's times and uh, and, and so on. Where should all the word processing really be done to produce the, excuse me, financial statements? And instead of each one of these offices having its own accounting department and its own word processing department, its own IT department, uh, what you do is you say maybe to the Birmingham office, right, what we're going to do is we're going to put all the accounting through the Birmingham office. And maybe in the Edinburgh office, we'll put all the human resources through the Edinburgh office. And all the other offices share that. This, great, this uh, produces great expertise. You have fantastic expertise in the Edinburgh office about human resources because you deal with an awful lot of it. Similarly, in the Birmingham office, deals with all the accounting. They will be absolute experts in that. You get great expertise. You get great economies of scale. Uh, and also, you can afford to have in these kind of centers of excellence, you can have really good people there. Whereas if you had 20 separate accounting uh, departments, you probably couldn't afford 20 qualified accountants, but you can afford one or two to go to the Birmingham office. Normally, uh, you want to charge to uh, the service centers to charge out. 
Uh, if they charge out, then uh, this allows them to make a profit potentially themselves. Uh, and people like to increase their profits. And one of the ways they increase their profits is that they can be efficient. They keep their costs down. Uh, and also, if somebody comes to, let's say, the Birmingham office and say, well, I would like another uh, financial report produced, because they're being paid to produce that other financial report, they're going to be more flexible. But if the shared service centre is more of a cost centre, uh, and what they have to do is to keep to a cost budget, then somebody coming in and saying, would you produce another report? All they see is extra costs going on. Whereas if they're a profit centre, they see opportunities for more profits, which increases their flexibility. Shared, shared service centres have become particularly popular and indeed possible because of good communication. Uh, computer networks enable it, so in the London office you can put in information needed for the billing that's going to be taking place through the Birmingham office to clients. Uh, people in the Bristol office can easily access human resources records which are maintained in the Edinburgh office uh, and so on. So good IT, good communications uh, is really what the shared service centres rest on because people don't want delays, they want information now and if information is not local, if it's held up in Edinburgh nevertheless it must be a kind of instantaneous way of being able to access that information uh, so you can carry on your job.